Bonaventure was born by the name of John of Fidanza in Tuscany in 1221, and he became one of the most significant Franciscan thinkers of the 13th century. Of course, the Franciscan order was founded not long before Bonaventure's birth in 1209 by Francis of Assisi, who was concerned to meet the spiritual needs of a rapidly changing society. Over the course of the later Middle Ages, the population had shifted from predominantly rural peasant farming communities to urban centers of learning, trade, and commerce. With this shift, we witnessed the rise of a relatively literate middle class that was increasingly unable to identify with the old spiritual ideals of the earlier Middle Ages and was able to detect, detect and challenge some of the corruption in the church at the time. It was in this context that Francis sought to call straying members of society to repentance. And in the case of his own followers, he insisted on a life of poverty, simplicity, and humility that would contest the growing preoccupation with acquisitions, wealth, and power. Bonaventure entered the Franciscan order in 1243, and he was quickly identified as a highly able friar who should have the privilege of going for higher theological studies at the University of Paris, which was center for theological study at the time. Bonaventure, in fact, finished what is effectively the medieval equivalent to a doctoral degree in 1257. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to develop his academic career much further because in the same year he finished his degree, he was elected Minister General of the Franciscan Order, which had by this time grown to number in the thousands. When he assumed this major, indeed the main role in the order, he immediately gained the massive responsibility for reconciling various factions within the order that had grown up since Francis's time. Not only factions within the Franciscan order, but also problems between Franciscans and external parties. You see, the Franciscans had become extremely effective at engaging in different pastoral ministries and working as university lecturers because they were so effective when, in many cases, the parish clergy were not. The Pope had a tendency to grant them privileges and effectively allow them to take over the jobs of parish priests and university masters. This, of course, gave rise to no little animosity amongst the secular clergy, that is, the clergy who were not members of religious orders, such as the Franciscans or the Dominicans. But it also caused problems within the Franciscan order itself, as many Franciscans, in particular those who had known Francis, believed that the acquisition of power and uh, receiving privileges was not at all consistent with the life of poverty and simplicity that Francis wanted his followers to lead. In what's probably his most well-known text, the Itinerarium Mentis in Deum, or the mind's journey into God, or also known as the soul's journey into God, Bonaventure can be read as attempting to reconcile these different factions. I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I'd also like to mention some of his other major works. Probably the first and most significant work was Bonaventure's commentary on Lombard sentences, which he, like all scholars at the time, would have had to write in order to obtain uh, the license to teach. This commentary effectively presents Bonaventure's views on all the major theological and philosophical issues that were of concern at the time. Thus, we have a good record of Bonaventure's beliefs on, on major questions of the day. In addition to this commentary, Bonaventure wrote a variety of spiritual writings and polemical works, as well as some disputed questions. So these were ordered disputations that would happen in the university or organized debates, effectively, that were then written down. While Bonaventure's Dominican contemporary, Thomas Aquinas, had the chance, of course, to write extensively over a very long academic career, I've already mentioned that Bonaventure's ability to write and pursue academic uh, 
activities was somewhat curtailed because of his role as Minister General. As a result of this, it's sometimes believed that Bonaventure is a relatively inferior thinker by comparison to Aquinas. And this perception of Bonaventure is exacerbated by a long-standing scholarly tendency to think of Bonaventure as a relatively unoriginal thinker who was primarily concerned with systematizing the sometimes unsystematic work of St. Augustine, whose tradition of thought had of course prevailed for most of the earlier Middle Ages. The reason Bonaventure wanted to do this, the story often goes, is that Aristotle's recently rediscovered works were rapidly rising in popularity and threatening to rival Augustine's authority. Of course, the story further tells us that Scotus and Occam, later 13th and early 14th century Franciscans, finally realized that the project of Bonaventure and the early Franciscan school was futile, that Augustine's system was now entirely outmoded given the intellectual changes of the day, and as a result, it's believed that Scotus and Occam and others at the time rejected the tradition of thinking in keeping with Augustine of their predecessors like Bonaventure and developed totally innovative theological and philosophical ideals that by many accounts laid the foundation for the development of modern thought. Unsurprisingly then, later th thinkers such as Scotus and Occam do receive more scholarly attention than a thinker like Bonaventure. Thankfully, interest in Bonaventure is starting to pick up and scholars are beginning to attend to the nuances of his thought and even to the respects in which the ideas he was developing laid the foundation for the further development of the Franciscan intellectual tradition. Still, there are a number of ways in which Bonaventure's originality and importance, indeed his pivotal place in the history of thought, remains to be brought into fuller relief. And to this end, I think there are a couple of factors that are important to take into consideration. One concerns the idiosyncrasies of the scholastic method that scholars like Bonaventure employed. If you look at a scholastic text, the first thing you'll probably notice is that thinkers like Bonaventure and Aquinas are using quotations from authoritative sources, especially the Church Father and the Bible, and they're presenting quotations for and against a particular position, and then they're drawing authorities in again in presenting their own account of the issue for which they've given pro and contra arguments. Well, this way of using so many proof texts or quotations from authorities might seem to suggest that scholastics like Bonaventure were mainly interested in interpreting or expositing or even defending the views of the authorities that they quoted. That wasn't necessarily the case, however. This, after all, was a time when everyone could choose to use sources from the tradition however they liked. And indeed, the responsibility laid upon scholastic thinkers in employing this scholastic method was to develop their own positions and to do this in a way that situated those positions within a larger tradition or stream of thought or with reference to the work of an authority who stood for a cause with which with the scholastic wished to associate himself. Well, Augustine, of course, stands for the long-standing and trusted spiritual and intellectual tradition of the medieval West. Thus, it comes as no surprise that Bonaventure would appeal to him in developing Franciscan points of view. Interestingly, however, Bonaventure and other thinkers at the time could not likely have known Augustine's own views on particular questions because they would not have had the entire works by Augustine and some other thinkers, although they did have complete works of more recent thinkers and uh, select scholars. It's not often recognized that only four works by Augustine were available to scholastics at this time. De Genesi ad Literam, Retractationis, De Vera Religione, and the 83 different questions. While these works are important, they arguably don't provide a sufficient basis for discerning Augustine's views on central issues. 
Thus, it seems unlikely that Bonaventure could have known Augustine's views or tried to interpret them even if he wanted to. When he's using quotations from De Trinitate or City of God or other very well-known works by Augustine, which one would probably need in order to know his views on particular questions, he's getting those quotations from a work like Lombard Sentences, which basically compiled quotations which could be found in other sources which had quoted Augustine and had been handed down through the tradition. Those quotations were picked up by Lombard and brought together in his sentences, which organized these quotations from authorities according to theological topics in a systematic fashion. All of this suggests that reading a scholastic text is a somewhat complex matter, and it's not entirely straightforward when someone like Bonaventure quotes Augustine or anyone else that he is actually endorsing the view of the authority he cited. As I've already suggested, it's more likely that figures like Bonaventure were attempting to enlist authorities like Augustine in an attempt to render authoritative their own new and potentially highly original perspectives. How then can we interpret a scholastic text or determine the purposes for which a thinker like Bonaventure would have been using quotations from authorities? In this connection, I think a second relevant factor is very important to take into consideration. And that factor is that scholastic thinkers like Bonaventure were theologians first and foremost. Uh, more specifically, they were members of particular religious